Kansas City, the capital of beef, the city at the end of the great cattle drives of yore. So what are we doing here with chickens in a restaurant named after some fish? Free range chickens and 40 sardines restaurant. That's up next on Chefs of Field. to be young and in love and to share a dream and to work and cook together. That's their story. Debbie Gold and Michael Smith of 40 Sardines Restaurant in Kansas City. We've been cooking together for about 15 years and um, I would say it's pretty intense. You know, it's kind of like double the energy, double the motivation. Debbie and Michael, Michael and Debbie, left hand and right, yin and yang. She's grounded and careful. He's the free spirit, the experimenter. Oh man, ooh, the cumin comes through. Saffron, already. How in the world can anyone come up with a restaurant name like 40 Sardines? Well, here's how. Well, that was, it's a story that we've been telling over the years that it was really an incident that in, in, in the south of France, in Nice. Deb and I had been there for years. We worked over there and, and uh, we were back visiting and we were having lunch at this little cafe in Old Nice. And, we were both having a plate of sardines, and I wanted some more off her plate. She says, get your own, order another one, whatever. So I order another plate, then I order another plate, and then pretty soon after too many glasses of wine, she bets me how many I could eat. I think Michael and I tell it a little different. He says I bet him, um, but he ate somewhere about 40 of them, and then it was just sort of, you know, one day we'll open up a restaurant, we'll call it 40 sardines, and it just kind of stuck. The restaurant is celebrating its first anniversary with two James Beard Award nominations and a pile of accolades. We relish the opportunity to make sure that the food on the plate is really good. As good as we can find, as good as we can prepare. I would rather have my food taste great, look great, and be sensible in terms of trying to find a great sustainability in the local area, good products, get good people to work with good products, and you have good food. Kansas City, it is known for cattle, not cucumbers. KC, steers, not spinach. Well, yes, but one does need vegetables on the plate. As the first European settlers arrived, Kansas came to be known as the Great American Desert because of its barrenness. Tough as it may be for a farmer, there are those who succeed at organic farming right here in Kansas City Mo. We had this other stuff called diatomaceous earth. Kevin Meller is trying new varieties, new techniques to encourage organic crops. And Michael knows how to cook them, knows how to present them. Kevin is cultivating what would be potatoes for the Lilliputians, baby potatoes the size of little candies. We haven't really hilled these yet. They've only been hilled one time, as you can see. We'll come back through so with a plow. Yeah, we'll come through with a plow and we'll actually throw dirt back up on the plant. All this will produce potatoes. We'll do that two, three times, probably wow. three times. So and this starts rooting out up here, like yes, this? Yes, and we'll give off little bitty potatoes like oh, this. Nice. When they're small like that, we get them, we just, we'll either roast them real quickly in a pan, serve right. them with the, like as a side dish, especially all the different colors you get during the summer. Or we'll toss in a salad sometimes, which are great. Right. So I can eat these out here in the yeah. wild? Oh yes, yes, they're <laughs> safe. We're safe here. Yeah, they're good. Well, these are still a little while to go, so yeah. we'll... So they'll just take root again and... Yeah, and then I'll come fine. check them again in a couple more weeks. And uh, we'll have some baby potatoes for you. Yeah, so, they look good. I've got some zucchinis here I want to show you too. One of your favorites. That oh, yeah, yeah. Two week run we, we use have. those. Yeah, we use those every year. The squash is just one of many in the gourd family that is valued and delicious. Here we go, Mike. Here's some of these blossoms that you're looking for. Oh, yeah. And then here, of course, is a blossom that we can just use to do whatever you're going to do with that baby. A tempura, that guy. Yeah. And then open up his leaf. Right. Dip him in a little bit of light batter and ksh, fry cool. him up. Well, now that's what I that's I like that size of zucchini. Yeah, anywhere. I prefer it too. I, I think sometimes these are too small. You know, mm -hmm. they're nice. They're beautiful on the plate, but I'd rather have a that. And then I really don't like to get them any larger than this right here. I agree. They're just too be, watery in the inside. And seedy. Too, too much seedy. Yeah. yeah, too much seed. It's just you know, everyone thinks they're getting more money out of their their. Because uh, you know what we do crop. a lot of zucchini. We 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 peel off 
all the skin with maybe a sixteenth of an inch of the white. Mm -hmm. Saute, chop it up real, real small. Saute it in olive oil and blend it real quickly in a high power, uh, high speed blender with olive oil. Make like a a puree of zucchini skin. It's unbelievable. That sounds good. It's uh, it rocks. It's so you you eat it and that's all it that's all you taste. It's incredible. That's great. The green zucchini. So yeah. Anyway, these are looking good. They're they're coming right along. Yeah, the whole you got a you got a whole. There's a bunch of zucchini going on here. Yeah. Kevin uses several farms, a form of insurance against Kansas' dust storms, tornadoes, and floods. This farm of Kevin's is tended by a Mennonite family whose devotion to simplicity fits nicely with Kevin's emphasis on the natural and the organic. Well, these look good and healthy in here. Yeah, it's starting to look really good, huh? Yeah, it's nice to see summer so, finally kicking in and we're getting some color. It's so funny that, yeah, that one can be perfectly ripe and then green. And right on the same cluster. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Let's see if we can find a nice red one here. Is this the kind you pick off the vine and bite? Yes, that's what I'm looking for. Here's a nice one coming up here for us, I think. Oh, yeah. There's a. I remember the one. first time I had one of these in an old farm, man, where some old guy says, You want to see my garden? He picks off a beautiful tomato, bit it just like an apple. I'd never done that before. He's, he's, get, he's getting there. He's still yeah. a little bit yellow. But that's a nice tomato. In a day or two, that'd just be beautiful to eat. Yeah, he's going to be good. So these aren't just some, like, supermarket thing man no these are no you know the difference is michael is uh when you get them from the store they actually pick them in a stage almost like this right yeah, here they're, they're, yeah and they let them ripen up on the road to wherever yeah. they're going to the four-day trip across so the they country. don't have all the nutrition and nourishment going to the fruit itself all, all right. that time so they turn red but you don't get the flavor th that is correct flavor and, and that has a lot to do with why you have a flavorless yeah uh, tomato it's how long it's hanging on the vine if you redesign the tomato so it will ship for 2,000 miles, which is the sort of trip most industrial produce makes in the United States, if you manufacture such a tomato, is it still a tomato? Okay, here's one. I see one. Nice and red. That has some nice color to it right there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Here, I'll split he looks him. edible. Does that look good? So I can split him open here, see what he's like inside. There, Green he's top. a little redder. Yep. Yeah. Nice a little, there. little better meat to it. Still, it's just a little green, but nice. good flavor it's though. Pretty yeah, good, delicious. Yeah. And that's a good tomato right there. You got the salt and pepper. Yeah, I forgot it. <laughs> that's good. When the cowpokes drove the steers into Kansas City a hundred years ago, and then sat down to breakfast, they piled into eggs such as these: eggs from free-range chickens, natural eggs. Nothing but the good stuff. Campo Lindo Farm, Jay and Carol Maddock and their kids. When Carol Maddock wanted to find a way to work and yet stay home with the children, she and Jay decided to raise chickens in a completely natural way. They use feed with no additives. The chickens go out and do what chickens do. They scratch. Debbie Gold has been buying eggs from Carol and Jay since the hens began laying eight years ago. And these are the layers. Okay. We have about 900 chickens in here. I'll let you show me what, what I usually do. Yeah. Is I grab the top nest because it's real important we get all of them. So I go through and get the eggs that are on the top. Okay. These are probably the easy ones because there's no chickens up there. No chickens in there. You won't get pecked. I know. I think I'm nervous about getting pecked my first time. And how many eggs usually does a chicken lay? She lays. We like for them to lay one egg a day. There's not one up there. So yeah, but they seem to have more than one in there. The hens seem to have their favorite nests. Oh, and they they almost stand in line so that they can all use the same nest. Yesterday, can I got you tell some... when they're like laying an egg and you not can. too disturbed? You'll, you can. you'll notice their position is very distinct. Oh, really? How long has it been since these eggs have been laid? They've been laid all this morning. We gather twice a day. Oh, this is a good. <laughs> Sorry. She's coming out. That's fine. Like I said, I'm waiting to get pecked. What kind of chickens are these? These are all specifically egg layers. Yeah. And some of them in here are red comets, and the others are what's called red sex links. Okay. And they're just specifically so an egg laying, right. brown egg layer. And so you know what determines the color of that? Ah, good question. <laughs> the type of chicken. Is it the chicken? Yep. So do you wash these before you send them out? Is yep. that what you do? And yeah. you'll get to help with that a little later on. I'm excited about that. We have our own feed ration that we've mixed up. It's corn, roasted soybeans, 
Um, there's a little bit of alfalfa in there, and we have to make sure we get a lot of calcium. Calcium? And so the we hard make shells? Yeah, yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah. So is it like a secret what proportions you put in there? That's you know? probably have to keep that a little bit yeah, quiet. Yeah. But the main thing is we're not feeding any antibiotics. Right, right. Um, that's one of the things that we really feel strongly about when we started this. Yeah. And hens are out running around free range. We've got a few eggs in here. Yeah. So uh, you don't have any roosters. You no, don't we don't. Males. We no don't. fighting amongst the girls, huh? No, they're pretty happy with any roosters for a while. We had a few. Yeah. Gently, ever so gently, move the eggs to a place to be washed. Well, this is not what I thought an egg washer looked like. It's actually like a mini little car wash in there. <laughs> and it works really, really well. That's wow, right. OK, that was pretty quick. OK, these are the little egg insert. What Carol sends out is not email, but egg mail, a note that goes into the carton with a few words describing the farm. Well, I appreciate all the time that you've taken out of your schedule to show me around and show how well, your you're farm welcome. works. welcome. Thank you so much for coming out and helping. Anytime you have oh. some free time, <laughs> we'll take the extra help. Take these back and do something special. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, there are several cultures that do stews or soups with a poached egg in the center of it. And since Debbie gathered up some great eggs uh, on, on, on the trip this weekend, and um, uh, so I'm going I'm to use an egg, poach it in the middle of a stew that's going to incorporate a lot of the great vegetables that I was able to gather yesterday with uh, Kevin. And I'm going to do uh, some different colored tomatoes, throw in a, some marble potatoes, some zucchini, throw in some at the last minute some zucchini blossoms, and uh, kind of do a, a broth that way. So I'm just going to get started with, a, I'm going to make my broth. I'm just going to do a little rough cut on some garlic. Set that aside. We'll use some of these nice spring onions. These are some of the onions we picked yesterday. And we got a few of the tomatoes yesterday. We got some zucchinis. These onions I'm going to chop up a little bit smaller, but everything else I'm going to leave pretty chunky. So it's a nice, big, uh, chunky, you know, real visible soup. We've got these tomatoes. We've got a green one here that we're going to throw in. We'll cook it a little longer. We'll dice each one of these tomatoes up. I'll leave the skins on and everything. It's, it's no big deal. I don't need to peel them. This is an unripe tomato at this point. And he'll, we'll have some green zebras in later in the year. But right now, it's just an unripe. But it, it'll look great. They taste great. They're real acidic. So it'll, it'll, it'll offer a nice balance to the soup. It's going to have some zucchini, which is not sweet, but a typical sweet, kind of on the sweet end of the spectrum. The, re the other tomatoes are going to be sweet. Um, the onions, you know, will give it that flavor, the garlic and all that. But it'll, it'll provide a nice balance with the acidity. Here we go. I've got a pan down. I'm going to let it get hot just a little bit. I'm going to pour in a little olive oil. I start most everything with olive oil. I, I cook some things in butter, but uh, I'm a big olive oil fan. I could drink a lot of olive oil if I had to every day. And while the uh, olive oil is kind of heating up, I'm going to hit it with just a little bit of garlic and get that sizzling just really lightly. You want it just to kind of, kind of sizzle in there and not, not start burning. Just lightly caramelize, pull out all its flavor, but not get too bitter with um, overcooking. So it starts flavoring the oil up. Throw in the onions real quick. I'm going to throw in a pinch of salt. I like to season things as we go. A little bit of everything. I didn't throw very much in because I'm going to need to salt these also. And now the, the garlic is really starting to caramelize just real lightly. Throw these guys in. I'm going to use a, not too many spices, but I'm going to use enough spice to kind of give it a, a Mediterranean tint. I'm going to use a little bit of saffron. So a little, a little bit of saffron is going to give it a nice orangey tint to when it's done. I want a little bit of heat, so some nice little chili flakes. And I'm going to go for some cumin, a little saffron, a little cumin. See, now all these tomatoes are starting to kind of create a pulp in there with some color. I'm going to ladle in a little bit of broth, just a little bit of chicken broth. Once my broth is kind of going, I'm going to throw in these little miniature uh, little, little marbles of potatoes. These are beautiful. So I'm going to put them in. Can I taste this? I need to taste this. Oh, man. Not ready. A little salt. Now we have a couple of components. I'm going to garnish the soup with uh, some squash blossoms. And we're also going to put an egg in this soup. A lot of cultures will 
serve this soup boiling hot in a bowl with a raw egg dumped right in it and the broth that's, bo that's pretty much a boiling state when it goes in the bowl will cook this egg and then the raw yolk will kind of thicken this soup and I'm not sure America, all of America uh, identifies with that so I'm going to pre-cook the egg a little bit, I'm going to poach it and then I'm going to dump it in as garnish. Got some water, some salt and some vinegar that goes in the water. That helps tighten up the egg white right around the yolk. So the best thing to do is uh, get going on the egg is to just crack it into this boiling water. The white part will wrap around the yolk and form the egg pretty easily. Farm fresh eggs are the best. Typically if you get an egg that's been in the supermarket and maybe it's come from somewhere around the country, if you were to poach that egg the exact same way, it might not hover around that yolk as tightly. And I'm going to open up one of these zucchini blossoms. I'm just going to do a little beer batter on it. Real light beer batter. And the others, I'm just going to kind of cut into a chiffonade, and that'll give a great, great flavor to the soup. So I've got a little bit of beer batter. We've just lightly covered this thing with flour, a little bit of egg, and our local Boulevard beer. It fries up real fluffy, not too thick on there, because you want the batter to be sheer enough that the colors of the zucchini kind of come through, the flowers will come through. See, our soup's coming together real nice right there. Look at that. Nice and chunky. The green tomatoes are going to stay a little bit more uh, crisp than the other ones. I'm going to put a little bit of zucchini in at the last minute because I want it to hold its color and I want it to just be nice and fresh. I'm going to add some herbs and then we'll be done. The zucchini blossoms are done. So now we have, we have it crispy, a light batter, and yet you can see the colors of the zucchini in there, all the striping there. That's great. The eggs are done. And then I'm just going to finish with squash blossoms. Give that a stir. The cilantro. All right, so now we're going to just make sure all this chunky stuff gets in there. Look at that, all that. You can see the yellows, you can see the red tomatoes, the potatoes. Oh, man. Got the zucchini blossoms in there. Ooh, the cumin comes through. Saffron, zucchini's perfect. Yum. Got a little egg. Put our zucchini blossom, it's nice and crispy still. And then um, a little bit of smoked paprika. If you want to do some garnish, a little olive oil. Always finishes the soup really nice. There we go. This is a Campo Lindo chicken. And uh, I've got some of the vegetables and fruit actually that uh, Michael got at Stover with Kevin. And I'm going to use the uh, sour cherries that are so good and are from this area. And then he had some asparagus and the scallions. And I'm also going to use some of the chicken livers. I'm just going to take off the breast, wash my hands. So now what I'm going to do is these are sour cherries that we're going to flavor with some of the pork. I take a little bit of pork because I want a little bit sort of, of a red wine flavor in the dish. I'm going to add some of the sour cherries to it and just let the port reduce down, make a syrup out of the port. And I'm going to put that on first so it has time to cook down. So what I want to do is I'm going to poach some of the um, scallions and I'm going to poach some of the asparagus um, and it'll be a, a sort of a fresh salad on the plate. And I'm going to cut these a little bit thick just because I'm going to poach them really quickly so it'll take some of that tart if it's too strong of an onion flavor for people. Because asparagus is really good. I like the fact that they're all different sizes because the plate's a little bit more rustic and it'll have a better look on the plate. And I have some boiling water on with, that we're going to poach everything in. And I'm going to add a little bit of salt to my water, my poaching water. I'm going to start with my onions just for a few minutes. And our cherries are boiling away in the pork. We'll let that go some more. In the meantime, I'll get a hot pan on to cook our chicken. While we wait for all that to poach, we can season our chicken with a little bit of salt and pepper. And I'm going to pull my scallions out of here. We'll cook off the chicken, and then we'll poach off our asparagus, put a little oil. And I always make sure my pan's hot and then I get my own because I want to get a nice crispy sear on my, the skin of the chicken. See, so it went right in there and it started cooking. We'll poach off our asparagus. 
I want the skin to become really crispy, so I put it in first side, that side down, because it hit the really hot pan and it should get a really nice crispy sear on it. I'm gonna look at my pork because as it reduces down, it, it's gonna get thicker and I don't want it to burn, but I'm waiting for it to come to a nice syrup consistency so that I can drizzle it on the plate. I'm gonna pull out my asparagus. Firstly, I like to go a little bit further than al dente on the asparagus, because I crunchy asparagus doesn't taste that good, I don't think. I guess in the meantime, I can pick my herbs that I'm gonna add. Some fresh thyme and some fresh tarragon. And I would suggest you use whatever you have growing in your garden. I'm not gonna chop these up much. I'm gonna uh, leave them pretty much the way they are. And what's fun about doing that is it's a different uh, taste when you eat the dish. If you chop up the herb, you know, really fine and you toss it in, it's gonna kind of be all over the dish. If you leave it bigger like I am, then it's not really until you bite into the herb that it'll give out its flavor. And I got some fresh chives. And I'm just gonna mix all of these together in the bowl. Turn my chicken over, see now I got a really nice crispy skin on my chicken. I'm gonna peek at my cherries here. Okay, so now I can tell just by looking at the syrup. The bubbles are getting real slow. I'm just actually gonna move it off to the side. So I have my herbs already mixed up in this little bowl. I'm gonna add my garlic. I'm gonna add my onions that I've poached, the scallions. And I'm gonna add some of the asparagus. A little bit more salt and pepper. And some olive oil. And actually, I'm gonna add some of the nice cherries. Just toss that a little bit so that it all gets mixed up. So I'm just really made a little bit of a salad with the onion and the garlic and some asparagus. And I'm gonna get a plate. This is gonna be an earthy dish and I think what's gonna help balance it is the sourness of the cherries. It'll bring out some really good flavor. For me, what ties it together is going to be the port syrup that we made. And then take some of our port. I'm taking the cherries out, because really, they've cooked down, and their flavor is infused into the port. This is our Campo Lindo chicken breast and chicken liver. We've made a little salad of scallion, uh, garlic, and asparagus, sour cherries, and a sour cherry port reduction. You need to know where the food came from, the hard work that went behind putting that together. And the base is what we're trying to do is, is local and try to support local people, whether it's a local restaurant or a local grower. And that's how we'll all survive.